God is good. Our subject for this evening, what is righteousness? What did I say? What is righteousness? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, help us in every way possible tonight. Specifically, dear God, speak through me. Also specifically, let the Spirit speaking through me enlighten those who are listening. Father, restrain the natural tendency to resist truth and help us to throw wide the doors of our hearts because it is truth alone that sanctifies and this is the will of God for us, our sanctification. It is truth alone that sets us free. So Father, give us a love for truth and put your words in my mouth. A special blessing on all our visitors, dear God, and if there are others on their way, bring them safely, I pray. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. amen. Let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, we shall read verse 142. Psalm 119, verse 142. If you found it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. That verse tells us that God is a righteous God. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Go to Psalm 11. Psalm 11. We read verse 7 of Psalm 11. Our subject, what is righteousness? Do we have Psalm 11 verse 7? What does that verse say? Read with me. The righteous Lord does what? Loveth righteousness. God loves what he is. Satan cannot love righteousness because he is not righteous. So the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Let's take a look at righteousness. Now, there is a principle that you should apply whenever you study the Bible or a law or a rule. Here's what it is. It is called the law of first mention. Let's pause, have some distinguished persons coming in. We're <laughs> glad they've made it safely. God bless you. File right down, led by Dr. Dave himself. All right. <laughs> okay. There is a rule that you must apply when you study the Bible. It is not enough to study the Bible. You must study it the right way. If we do not, we will be misled. And we're never misled by the spirit of truth. We're misled by the spirit of error, that is Satan. The rule I'm giving to you now is called the law of first mention. What that law simply says, when studying any Bible subject, go where the subject is first introduced. This is where you encounter the root of that teaching. And that root now serves as the anchor that guides you throughout the Bible all the way down to Revelation 22. All doctrines have roots. For instance, if you study the state of the dead, you don't begin in Luke 16 because Luke 16 does not talk about the state of the dead, despite what people say about the rich man and Lazarus. You begin in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, which describes how man was made from dust. That's really where you begin. Then you go to Genesis 3, verse 19. Dust thou art, unto dust shalt thou return. If you want to study sin, you don't begin in Romans and Galatians. You go all the way to uh, Genesis chapters 2 and 3. God said, if they you eat, you die. And go, that's where sin is introduced. If you want to study worship, you don't go to Leviticus. You go all the way back to uh, Genesis 22, where Abraham is first mentioned. Abraham said, the lad and I will go yonder and worship. First introduced. So whenever you study the Bible, where is this thing first introduced? If you study diet, you don't go to Mark or to uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 3. For every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused, at verse 4. You go to uh, Genesis chapter 7, of every clean beast. Thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and the female. And so from this point on, one, one way to avoid error is to make sure you study correctly. Another rule to employ is this. A clear verse must be used to explain an unclear verse. Not an unclear verse to explain a clear. In other words, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. 
then you don't go to Galatians 2, 16, uh, Colossians 2, 16 and say, let no man judge you in the holy day and say that verse says don't keep the Sabbath. That's unclear. There's a lot of argumentation as to what that actually means. There's no argument about remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. So a clear verse must be used to explain an unclear verse. All right, but tonight we're focusing on the law of first mention. And what does that law say? When studying any subject, begin where it is first introduced. So if you want to study the word of God, you don't begin in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. You begin in Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's your introduction to the power of God's word. Now, let's go to Genesis 7. Our subject, what is righteousness? It is a 10 after 7. I want to release you by 7.45 if possible. But if the Spirit pushes me to 8 o'clock, please don't be agitated. Genesis 7, we shall read from verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Why? For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, the ark was a physical structure, but spiritually it represents salvation or Christ. Are you with me? There is salvation in whom alone? Jesus, Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. That is the name of Christ. And so that ark, in a certain sense, represented Christ. It represented salvation. The qualification to enter that ark is laid out in Genesis 7-1. Listen to the words of God. And God the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, not just near the ark, Many people near the ark drowned. You didn't I get what I just said. <laughs> there are a lot of people who will be lost while sitting in church singing hymns. Because they're in the church. They are not in Christ. And so I say again, there were people who drowned right outside of the ark. God said, come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. This is our introduction to this word righteous or righteousness. Now, one way to describe something is to, describe, to say what it is not. So if you were to say, what is an elephant? An elephant is not a small animal. It is not small at all. Are you correct? Yes. Yes. So one way to find out what righteousness is, is to take a look at what it is not, or look at its opposite. Are you with me? Let us look at the opposite of righteousness, then we will understand why God said, Thee have I seen righteous before me. Genesis 6, reading from verse 1, our subject, what is righteousness? The Bible says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. By the way, God always gives us a certain period of time in which to make the right choice. And it is never an eternal period. You notice it varied from circumstance to circumstance. Before the flood, they had 120 years. In uh, Daniel 9, uh, 25 to 27, the Jews had 480. In Genesis 15, God told Abraham, the Amorites' wickedness is not yet fulfilled. They had 400 years. The time God gives to do what's right varies from person to person, from nation to nation. Understand that clearly. So that God looks at you and God decides, I'm giving you five years. I'm giving him 15. God knows the circumstances that favor you to reply to, to respond to God's word. God knows his circumstances are not as favorable. He gives him 15. He gives you five. And so God said, yet his day shall be 120 years. Let me ask those of you who have not yet surrendered to Christ, how much time do you have left? You know how much time you have left? You have tonight. 
because no one has a written receipt for tomorrow you and I have tonight that's the time you have left verse 4 there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them the same became mighty men which were of all men of renown they were renowned for the wrong things you can be famous as Mandela is famous for what he did or you can be famous like Hitler are you with me both are famous so these men were men of renown but disrepute would have been a better word verse 5 and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart and the Lord said I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repenteth me that I have made them now with all of that from verse 1 to 7 we have the background to understand righteousness but verse 8 says but Noah what does but introduce contrast in other words we were talking about darkness what are we discussing now light but Noah found grace now those between verses 1 and 7 did not find grace because God said in verse 5 and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually the wickedness had reached such a height that it drove God to repent that he ever made mankind God said I'll destroy them God does not destroy a man who has found grace and so Noah now is the very opposite of that group, Noah and his family. And Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. Same thing as righteous. And perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now, a wicked person does not walk with God. By the way, Noah had a great grandfather who walked with God. So there's some things we pass on. What was his name? Enoch. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible says Noah walked with God. What can we assume about the people described in verses 1 to 7 of Genesis 6? They did not walk with God. Let's make another assumption. The Bible says in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, can two walk together except what? They be agreed. Now, for you and God to agree, you have to agree with God. Why? For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God cannot lower his level of righteousness to correspond with our wickedness. He brings us up through the power of the gospel so that we can meet God at a high level. Now that's how we walk with God. And so for Noah to walk with God, Noah walked according to God's way, not God according to Noah's way. I'm going too fast. What did I ask you to do when I go too quickly? Why are you so disobedient? <laughs> Why haven't you slowed me down? You know, when I get excited, I rush along. Okay. Noah walked with God. Because Noah accepted God's standards. That's the only way to walk with God. Noah agreed with God, not God with Noah. There are too many Christians trying to get God to agree with them. Are you listening to me? And so the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath. Most people say, no, the first day is Sunday. So they want God now to agree with them. It doesn't work. We must agree with God. God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And we say, but Father, I only committed with one person. So I am faithful in my adultery. This is monogamous adultery. No, 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 no. We must see things. God, God said, don't do it. Then I don't do it. That's the way to walk with God. You don't negotiate with God. You accept his way unchanged, unedited. And so Noah walked with God. He was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now we go to verse 1 of chapter 7. And we encounter our word for tonight. The subject, what is righteousness? And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous. Now what do you understand by thee have I seen? Is God referring to physical, optical eyesight? This suggests an examination 
Are you listening to me? Listen to Genesis 1 verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. This is evaluation. Are you following me? This is assessment. Is this the light I had in mind when I said, let there be light? The answer was yes. That's why God saw it was good. If something does not correspond to what God has in mind, God cannot say it's good. So if my life is not what God has in mind for me, he cannot say that's good. And so God said, thee have I seen righteous before me. I don't care what your neighbors say or your unsafe family members. I have judged you to be righteous. There are many people who accept the truth and their family members put them through a living hell. But God sees you as righteous in your tribulation, in your trouble, as you lose your job, as you're determined to keep the Sabbath, as you maintain your moral dignity. And so you pass by all kinds of marriage offers from unbelievers. God says, that's a righteous person. The world says, you're stupid. You're 27, still single. The man has a car, two cars, and you turn him down. And God says, that's a righteous person. The world says, that's a stupid woman. And so God said, thee have I seen righteous before me. And remember, God does not see as man sees. And so righteousness now is contrasted with all that we read in Genesis 6, 1 through 7. Righteousness is cooperation with God. Righteousness is walking with God. And to walk with God, we must agree with God. Let's take another look at righteousness. Genesis 15. Genesis 15. You should read from verse 1. Are we there? After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. By the way, God said that to Abraham right after chapter 14, when Abraham fought a battle, won, brought back all the, the treasure, and the king of Sodom said, just give me the people, you keep all the treasure. But Abraham said, no, you keep it. I don't want you to say you made me rich and throw aspersions on my God's name. You keep everything. Abraham said, I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet. When Abraham made that sacrifice for the honor of God, God comes right away in verse 1 of chapter 15. Remember, the Bible was not written in chapters, so you must read 14 right into 15. And God said, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What you lost by not taking the, the spoils of war, I will give you. When Abraham backed off and allowed Lot to choose first in Genesis 13, and Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, he left the rocky hills for Abraham. Right after that, God came to him in verse 14 of Genesis 13 and says, lift up now thine eyes from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it. So Lot only chose the plain of Sodom. God said, Abraham, I will give you the whole world, including the place that Lot just chose. Always honor God and God will bless you beyond your imagination. And so in Genesis 15, verse 1, the Bible says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, I am thy fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Elias of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. I mean, no child. And lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. The word tell means count. If thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Now, that statement was a human impossibility. Because Genesis 11.30 tells us, but Sarai was barren, she had no child. So even before we read the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, we're told in Genesis 11.30, his wife was barren. But God said, and I will make of thee a great nation, Genesis 12 verse 2. And so when God says, so shall thy seed be as the stars of the heaven. But Abraham is thinking, but my wife can't have children. There are times where God will say to you, the impossible when God says that do not look at your limitations 
Look at the limitless power of God. I need a bigger amen than that. Very often, Christians crumble and fall because they see an impossible task. And they view the task in the light of their power, which is minimal. And they panic. We must see the challenges of life in the light of the power of God, of whom it is said from the lips of Christ in Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And so God said to Abraham, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, now this is the word of God, so shall thy seed be. Verse 6 of Genesis 15. Read with me if you have the King James Version. And he did what? Believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for right. Now we have another insight into righteousness. Righteousness is associated with our attitude to what God says. He believed. Now belief is not just a feeling. It is a response. It is an action. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says faith without works is dead. So when Abraham accepted God's word, he, 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 he responded to it. He acted on it. And God said this is righteousness. He took God at his word. No discussion. My brothers and sisters, a righteous person is someone who takes God at his word and acts upon that word. Will somebody say amen? amen. So if the Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath, you take it and you act on it. And we, okay, I want more amens than one. Come on, say amen. You take it and you act on it. Why? Because God said it and a righteous man accepts God's word, however impossible the word may sound. So righteousness is not just dressing in a white suit and coming to church and sitting in the front. Righteousness is your attitude towards God's word. When God speaks the impossible, you surrender to the word because of who said it. And so the Bible says that he believed in the Lord. I want you to observe verse 1 of Genesis 15. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, what came to Abram? The word of the Lord. But in whom did Abram believe? In God. The only way to believe in God is to believe in his word. Do you know how many Christians believe in God and never study God's word? I think I told a congregation at Santon, a person who does not study God's word and claims to be a Christian is not a Christian. The person is a church member, not a Christian. You cannot remove God's word from the righteousness of the life. He believed in the Lord. He believed in what God said. And God says, Abraham, because you accepted and you responded to this impossible statement, you responded to my word, I count that as righteousness. Now, Righteousness is agreeing with God. Righteousness is accepting God at his word. Righteousness is walking with God. Righteousness is the opposite of every form of evil. Let's go down to Genesis 18. Genesis 18, we shall read from verse 23. In this chapter, God has come down. Jesus Christ came down with two angels. And Christ is speaking with Abraham, and the two angels have gone down to Sodom to chat with Lot. Abraham knows now he's talking to the creator of heaven and earth. Verse 23, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Let's pause. There are only two classes of people on the earth. Name them. Righteous and wicked. Let me give you a quotation from a brilliant writer. The book is Christ Object Lessons, the quotation, page 283, paragraph 3. There are only two classes in the world today, and only two classes will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law and those who obey it. That's it. There are not three classes. Those who are trying to decide. Those who violate and those who obey, and that's it. And so Abraham says to God, who will be the judge in the last days, he says, will thou also destroy the righteous, with the wicked. Verse 24. 
of Genesis 18. Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city, will thou also destroy and, sp and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Finish the verse for me, 25. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The right thing for God to do is to save a righteous man, finish my thoughts, and destroy the wicked. That itself is an act of righteousness. Ah, you missed it. Ah, you missed it. Listen to Abraham again. Listen to the, how the final statement. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what? Do right. Righteousness is doing what's right. So when God destroys the wicked, it is an act of what? Say it loudly. Righteousness. When he saves the righteous, that is an act of righteousness. And so Abraham, with well-guarded respect but boldness, he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Listen to me. When you obey God, the right thing for God to do is to save you. Because he's saving you to live in a world wherein dwelleth righteousness. And the Lord said, verse 26, Genesis 18, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all, their, all the place for their sakes. Powerful verse. Let me ask what I asked the family in Santon. If God had found 50 righteous, and there were five cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela, 10 people per city, and he had saved the cities, would the saved people have been righteous? think would they have been righteous what would he have saved them from death not sin death so by saving them from death he would have extended their what probation giving them a second chance now the basis of probation then is what what did God say I have to find for me to save the wicked righteousness the basis of probation is righteousness it is because of the righteousness of Christ that the world is not destroyed yet and so God said if I find 50 righteous now there are two kinds of righteousness a truly righteous Christian is covered with the righteousness of Christ there isn't the righteousness for the human being and the righteousness for Jesus. His righteousness becomes ours. And Jesus, who was the one talking to Abraham, said, If I find 50 righteous, because of that, I will save the wicked from death, giving them a more time to change. Righteousness is a preservative. Which means your family in your neighborhood should be a preservative. What did you say? <laughs> okay. You in that office complex should be a preservative. I, on that 747 flying 15 hours from Johannesburg to Atlanta, United States, should be a preservative. If wherever the righteous are found, there the mercies of God are found even for the wicked. But of course that won't last forever. Because God hates sin so much, he must come back and put an end to it. And so we see now righteousness. It is walking with God. Righteousness is the opposite of all forms of evil. Righteousness is taking God at his word. Righteousness preserves a person from God's destruction. He cannot destroy a righteous person. Now, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter is talking about all the past experiences when God had to punish wicked people in verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell. So they sin, he punished them. Verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, a preacher, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So we read now that Noah, who is described as just in Genesis 7-1. Now Peter is talking about this same man. And the Bible says that God brought in the flood upon whom? Look at the end of verse 5 of 2 Peter chapter 2. 
the world of the ungodly. Now listen to how the verse begins. But spared not the old world, and spared not the old world, but saved whom? Noah. Now we read in Genesis 18, 25, God does not destroy the righteous with the wicked. So the very fact that God destroyed Noah tells us Noah was righteous. Those who were destroyed were? Or what does the verse, what word does the verse use? Ungodly. So if being unrighteous is being ungodly, being righteous is being what? Yes. Listen to this quotation. Education page 18, paragraph 3. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God-likeness is the goal to be reached. God doesn't have low standards for his people. The same way parents have high standards when they send their children to school. God has high standards. Godliness. We must have a character that God has. We cannot have the substance God has. He's eternal. We must have the character. It is not the substance that saves us. It's the character. And so bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly again in other words what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah will happen to you ungodly verse 7 and delivered just lot the word just also means righteous vexed with the filthy conversation of the righteous now we have another insight into righteousness a righteous person has what kind of reaction to sin I'd be upset only with his sin with what sin a righteous person reacts to sin anywhere and in anyone. A righteous person is bothered by sin. You know how many Christians are not bothered by sin? Here's what they say. Well, if you want to have a homosexual relationship, you go ahead. It's not for me, but it's fine. I respect your right. That's how we react. Mm -mm. You must hate it wherever you see it. I'm not saying you judge people, but you judge behavior. We must hate sin. And so the Bible says that right and delivered just lot, vexed, upset with all the wickedness he saw, with the filthy conversation of the what? What's the last word in verse 7? The wicked. So an unrighteous person is wicked. Remember Abraham, will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Let's go to verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day finish the verse with the an ah an unrighteous person lives what kind of life an unlawful life now what law are we referring to the ten commandments that's the whole duty of man now if an unrighteous person is an unlawful person what is a righteous person yes yes it's a person who lives in accordance with God's law. A righteous person. Why is that? Let's go to Deuteronomy 6. Let's read verse 25. Deuteronomy 6, 25. Our subject is, what is righteousness? Has anyone said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth? Any, ah, God bless you and your family. Whoever did it, thank you very much. Those of you who are politely stubborn, please pray for me. And ask the Lord to put his words in my mind. And please tell me, slow down. You know I am going too quickly. You're not saying anything. But likeness can only go so far. Help me by telling me, slow down. What verse did I, what book did I say? Deuteronomy, what chapter? 6, what verse? 25. Do you have the King James Version? Read with me. And what? It shall be our righteousness if we want observe to do all the commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Give me another definition of righteousness. Say it again. Obedience to God's law is righteousness. Now, let's go to Isaiah 51 7 quickly. Having read Deuteronomy 6 25, let's go to Isaiah 51 7. We just said, obedience to God's law is righteousness. Because the law is holy, just, and good. So when you obey it, your behavior is holy, just, and good. Isaiah 51, 7, what does the Bible say? Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. Go on, read now. The people in whose heart is my law. To know righteousness as a practical experience, God's law has to be where? 
in the heart. Where does the Bible say God will write his law? In our hearts. Not so much in the intellect, in the heart. You see? Where we are on our feelings, our, you know, it's, it's the heart. The heart is used as the, the center of control. That's where the law goes. Because a lot of people have an intellectual view of the law. Oh, yes, this is a nice standard. Then they go drink and smoke and do whatever they do. But we need to have a relationship with righteousness. We must love it. And so the heart brings in both the mind and, and the feelings and everything else. It, that's where God's law is. The people in whose heart is my law. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 1. Our subject is, what is righteousness? Romans 8, reading from verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the what? But after the? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now read verse 4 with me, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled where? In us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In other words, in order for righteousness to be fulfilled in us, how must we walk? After the spirit. What spirit is this? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So we have now the Holy Spirit as a central actor in this drama called righteous living. Without the Spirit, no one can live a righteous life. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It is through the power of the Spirit that we can live an obedient life, which is a righteous life. In other words, my brothers and sisters, let me give you this quotation. Uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 97, paragraph 3. Listen carefully. The man who attempts to obey the commandments of God from an obligation merely because he's required to do so, will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. When the requirements of God are considered a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. Obedience must be an experience of joy for us. Righteousness is love for right doing. And the standard of right doing from Genesis to Revelation is God's law. What have we discovered? Righteousness is everything that sin is not. Righteousness is an experience in which two people walk together in correspondence. Who are the two people? God and I. Righteousness is a total surrender to the impossibility of God's word. Are you with me? Whatever it says, I surrender to it, not by feeling, by action, because faith without works is dead. Righteousness is only possible through the central action of the Holy Spirit of God. Righteousness is conformity to God's law. One word for that is obedience. Now, why is righteousness so essential? Now, God is preparing us for a place in his kingdom. Let's go to John 14. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject is, what is righteousness? It's about 16 minutes to 8. I will go beyond 745. Forgive me for breaking my word, but it's not my fault. There's a power behind me that told me, keep going. So you can't blame me. John 14, reading from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You know, <laughs> there's some people who believe in God, they don't believe in Jesus. Jesus is clear. If you believe in God, you've got to believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Let me pause there. Anything that has changed, God will tell you. Ah, uh, you missed it again. <laughs> if God changes his word, he'll tell you. Listen to Jesus. If it were not so, finish it for me. Now listen to me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
But since I haven't told you, nothing has changed. If it were not so, says God, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Now Christ is preparing a new world for us, a new city. Okay, now, how do you have to live in that city? Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, our subject, what is righteousness? 2 Peter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth. Finish the verse. Wherein dwelleth right the lifestyle in the new world is righteousness. Consequently, to prepare for that life, we practice righteousness now. And righteousness is conformity with God's law. Righteousness is walking with God. Righteousness is submitting to the claims of God's word and acting. Righteousness is doing whatever God says. That's the world where we're headed. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. But even before we get to that world, here's where righteousness comes in again. Let's go to uh, Acts 17. We shall read verse 31. Before we get to that world, some decision has to be made. Acts 17, reading verse 31. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke, not Paul, Luke. You're not far away. They travel together. You're close, but... Right house, wrong room. Okay. Acts 17, 30. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world how? Oh, you, don't, you haven't found Acts 17, 31 yet. For, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world how? In righteousness. In other words, when God decides, who shall I admit to the new world? You have to be righteous. What's the standard of righteousness? The law of God. Everything God does is done on the basis of righteousness. Let's go to Revelation 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Oh, so, oh thank you. God bless you. All right. We have some nice people in the front. The people in the back did not say a thing. Revelation 19.11, do we have that now? Yes. May I proceed slowly? And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Now read with me. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. What's the purpose of war? To build friendships? What's the purpose of war? To destroy. So in righteousness he doth judge. So God has judged. And he determined, you're wicked, you have not obeyed me. Then he destroys, that's war, you see. Both are acts of righteousness. That's why God can never do you something wrong. Now, human beings love to get angry with God, with a God who cannot do wrong. Are you with me? They will please a sinner and get angry with God. God cannot do anything wrong. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. Let's go to Psalm 98. Psalm 98, we read the last verse of that Psalm. Psalm 98, the very last verse. Before the Lord, for he cometh to what? Judge the earth. How will he do it? With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Equity and righteousness are the same thing, fairness. God judges in righteousness. So we have a God who is preparing a world where the lifestyle is righteousness. In order to populate that world, he is preparing a people now and by his indwelling power, he creates and as what? Produces righteousness. Now he will judge the righteous, the wicked, and the standard by which he judges is the standard of righteousness known as the Ten Commandments or the law of God. And the Bible says he himself is our righteousness so that a righteous person is a person who lives with Christ within my brothers and sisters what saved Noah's family from death give me one word righteousness 
What led to the destruction of the rest of the world? Sin. What saved Lot from the fiery furnace of Sodom and Gomorrah? Give me one word. Righteousness. What led to the destruction of all the others? Sin. What will gain us admission into the new world? Righteousness. What will gain people admission into the fires of hell? Sin. Pick one. Now we ask ourselves tonight as I close the holy book regretfully. Let's examine our lives the past three months. Is that a righteous life? No, I'm not disturbed. You, I told you, you, you look at your life, I look at mine. I'm not peeking into yours. Look at yours, I look at mine. Is that, look at the choices we make, the places we go, the people we associate with, the things we eat, the things we drink, the things we watch, the things we read, the thoughts we entertain. Is that a path of righteousness on which, I'm not saying an occasional slip, look at the trend of our lives just for the past three months. If that trend is not a righteous trend, it can change tonight. By confession, which is admitting I'm wrong. Repentance, which means I was going south, now I go north, the exact opposite. And surrender to the righteous man who lived in human form. What's his name? Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, the Pharisees were leaders of the church, and we need that. We have a few among us. It's not church office that qualifies you for a place in God's kingdom. It's the righteousness of Christ. Amen. And in Revelation 19:8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in white linen, clean and white, for the white linen is the righteousness of the saints. And wherever God sees righteousness, he cannot destroy. Wherever he doesn't see it, he cannot save. As he looks at me, what is God seeing tonight? So in a certain sense, we destroy ourselves by the choices we make. God simply accepts our stubborn decision to disobey him or our stubborn decision to obey him. He just accepts. It's a remarkable thing that God is the most powerful being in the universe. The second most powerful is Satan. Neither one can force us to obey him. So here's the most powerful being God. He says, obey me. Here's the most, second most powerful being Satan says, obey me. The choice is ours. And so I say tonight, please accept Christ. Accept righteousness. Accept to walk with God on whose terms? His terms. How many will say, Father, I choose tonight as the Spirit convicts me to walk with you, to walk in agreement with you, and to live a righteous life by your power. May I see your right hand? Or by your power, because we can do it. Stand up with me. No man can live a righteous life by his own strength. It's impossible. Because a righteous life is a divine life. And no one can do it outside of the enabling power of God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. It's clear, straightforward. If we will only do what Jesus tells us to do through the prophet Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together. Father, we don't need your insight to see that our lives are in the wrong direction. And tonight, perchance, your spirit has convicted numerous hearts. And we have realized with some trepidation and fear that the direction our, of our lives is not a righteous direction. Father, that direction can change right now. And so while heads are bowed, eyes are closed, if there's a man or a woman who as you have looked over the past three months, you realize you may be moving in the wrong direction and you want God to redirect you tonight in the path of righteousness. If that is your honest conclusion, you know, I was moving in the wrong direction. I need God to redirect me in the path of righteousness. If that is your story, raise your right hand. You think you've been moving in the wrong direction. Keep your hand up. But tonight, the word of God has opened your eyes. I need to get back on track before I go too far. Keep your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus, who died to make righteousness available to us, who died to make divine power available to human beings, who died to provide power to conquer death, hell, the sin, grave, and Satan, 
in his name and name you always accept bless those who've raised their hands to say father i believe i've been moving in the wrong direction redirect my steps tonight so that it may be said of me as it was said of enoch and noah and this brother or this sister walked with god dear father in heaven give us a taste a desire for that life in the new world where there will be no sin put into our hearts a hatred for the world and the things of the world let your word be our sweetest food our cooling drink and for those who've recommitted our lives to you today god accept this recommitment help us to do it day by day as we leave let us leave as children of god walking with our god in the path of righteousness so that when our savior comes he may do the righteous thing and save righteous people. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen.